I guess this can only go one way from here, right? And that's downhill, right? So uh, thank you very much. That's, um, that's uh, you know, uh, a, a very nice introduction. So I hope I can even get close to living up to that. Um, so I would say at the outset, um, I try and make matters as interactive as possible. So if I do say something that's kind of ambiguous or you don't understand what I've done or said, then please fire away and ask, right? And if it turns out that I've got through two slides after 40 minutes, then I will be very tough with the remaining people who kind of uh, pop up with a question. Okay, um, just before I start on the talk proper, which is, as Michael says, it's about um, the notion that we're trying to outsource a lot of our memorizing onto digital objects. I want to just talk, have a quick plug for two other areas where I'm actively pursuing research. And the first area is online communities, which is, I guess, like a lot of people are interested in that. Um, one of the things that we think is missing from this area is there's a lot of empirical study, but what's not really been tackled is that the majority of online communities fail. So according to our own, our, our own statistics, something like, by some you know, moderate criterion, something like 85% of online communities fail. And part of it, there are two reasons for that. One is technical and the other is uh, social. Um, and what we're interested in doing is trying to build, um, I, I guess, kind of uh, tools, um, dashboard type tools, which allow designers of online communities uh, to monitor and adjust um, their progress in developing a community. And in particular, one of the, the things we're getting very interested in is the whole focus of Web 2.0 has been on end user creation of content, but you know, five minutes on Facebook would tell you that what a lot of people are doing now is they're just sharing links. So it's more about curation than creation. And we're very interested in the process of how in online communities, you basically kind of manage and re-refer to and repackage existing content. So that's the direction we're going in right now. We have a bunch of tools, and this is a collaborative project with uh, IBM. Okay, and now just on the on the PIM topic, I just want some breaking news to a couple of uh, bits of breaking news here. Um, we've got one kind of pretty funky NSA style project going here, which is basically show me your file system and I'll tell you all about yourself, right? So um, what we find, for example, is by looking at your desktop, I can tell on classic big five personality dimensions, I can tell whether you're neurotic or conscientious just by looking at your desktop which is kind of interesting. I, I mean, I guess the backdrop is spooky these days, but we were just interested. This was something we'd kind of seen empirically. It was an intuition that people had. And I guess now we can kind of basically, uh, we can uh, prove that relationship. The other thing, uh, direction that I'm going in, which is, uh, again, <laughs> again, pretty interesting to me, is um, trying to look at the relationship between the brain actually doing neuroscience and looking at how we, um, I guess, manage our personal information. And one of the paradoxes, uh, which Michael will be very familiar with, is that when we're operating with our personal information, we're very reliant on navigation for it, right? That's to say we're kind of clicking through uh, an organized file hierarchy to find stuff. And there are all sorts of in-principle reasons why desktop search, you know, that thing at the top right-hand corner if you're a Mac user, you know, why that's a more efficient way to do it. Because you don't have to remember, you know, the specific location of something. You can just remember a file attribute. However, you know, time after time, study after study, we find that people prefer to navigate. So it's something like, I guess, people search about 6% of the time. And that's... That's interesting because that's independent of the quality of uh, your search engine. So one of the things we're interested in was, was there some kind of very deep biological reason why people did this? And what we find is the answer is yes, right? So if, if you give people stuff to find on their personal computer, if they're searching for it, then they use the linguistic part of their brain, which is also known as broker's area, 
If you ask them to find something by navigation, they use basically the animal part of their brain, which is exactly the same part of the brain that they would use if they were physically searching for an object such as lost keys. So what our argument is, you know, and, you know, knock me down right now, is, is kind of that the preference for this, uh, the, uh, this uh, n navigational preference reflects a deep-seated way that we actually want to kind of, and a, a, a very highly used way, practiced way of, of accessing information, which is using physical navigation. Even though, of course, if you're looking for stuff in your, that's virtual now. You're not moving in a, in a real physical environment. Anyway, so just that, that's just kind of a placeholder because I think it's an interesting direction that we can maybe take um, HCI researches. I'm very interested in this bridge to neuroscience. Anyway, anybody any questions about either of those two, uh, the second one, fairly bizarre directions? Okay. So um, I want to talk today about... Um, some work, um, some work, I guess I've been doing this style of work for about 10 years now, and um, I want to take you through three different stages of this research and three different approaches to the idea of, um, if you like, remembering or reminiscing using digital materials. And what I want to do first is I want to take a very classic um, CS, technology-inspired approach to memory which is the life logging approach. So how many people here are familiar with life logging? OK. Well, the basic idea behind life logging is that you try and record everything. And you know, in these days of the NSA, you know, we're saying that that's not too weird to be thinking about, right? And as we move into an era of um, you know, wearable computers, sensors, you know, maybe brain sensing, then a lot, massive amounts of our personal data will and can end up online. So the idea behind this perspective is just that we'll just be, you know, we'll re be recording massive amounts of data about ourselves, and that will mean that we basically don't forget an anything, right? Because everything is recorded in some way. So that's the first perspective I'll explore, and I'll, I'll talk about some studies that we did to actually see, you know, evaluate the truth of, with current technologies, what that kind of perspective looks like. Then I want to talk about, um, you know, I guess a reaction against that, which is trying to look at situations where we don't want to remember stuff, right? And I'll explore a study that we did which led to some designs which were talking about, uh, which were addressing the problem of, for example, if you're in a relationship, you may not, sorry, if you're in a relationship which breaks up, that might be a situation in which you don't really want to, quote, to remember everything. So we talk about how people feel about digital possessions in that context. You know, the fact that every online song reminds you of that other person. You know, you've got uh, your Facebook feeds full up of, you know, friends of that person or references to that person. You fall across, you come across digital photos uh, of that person. These are all now part of an, our extended memory, and that can be kind of destructive in a situation where you're trying to move on. So we, we talk about people's experiences, some studies that we've done looking at people's experiences in that context, and I want to present some designs for helping us kind of get through that stage. And the last thing I want to talk about is some recent work I've been doing with a system called ECHO, and what we're trying to do with ECHO is we're trying to promote psychological well-being by using digital data about our pasts, presenting it back to us, having us kind of rethink past events, past experiences, and seeing whether that can actually allow us to be, um, if you like, more mindful about recurrences of that situation, uh, about situations that upset us, about situations that we like, and maybe take adaptive actions when we have that greater knowledge, right? So this is, you know, I mean, I, mean, I guess my big plug for this last style of work is, you know, the NSA has basically taken a lot of personal data away from us. What I think we can do with this type of application is kind of reclaim that type of data and sort of use it to increase our own self-knowledge. And you'll see, I'll present some data about deployments of the system, and I think we've got some really striking results which show that basically we can make people a little bit happier by deploying this type of system. And I mean that in a scientific way. 
I don't mean that like they smile more when they used it. OK, so um, yeah, Michael alluded to this. I, I, I want to, I guess, talk about um, you know, different outputs that I, for, for this research. Um, so I'll talk about new technologies uh, that we devised to evaluate and actually improve the outputs of life logging, which is the kind of remember everything perspective. I want to talk about evaluations of existing technologies such as Facebook. So when we looked at the relationship uh, issues, the, the issues that people had in moving on from a kind of uh, a past relationship, one of the things that we ended up doing was scrutinizing Facebook very, very closely. So that's looking at empirically evaluating an existing technology. And then I want to talk about some, you know, in, as I weave my way through this, I want to talk about different new technologies that we're trying to invent in this context. And I want to talk about technologies for impulse control. So one of the problems that people have in the context of moving on from a uh, sort of past relationship is they kind of can't stop themselves reaccessing information about that person. So we, I'm going to present some designs for technologies that can kind of help you control yourself better, right? So the situation is, how do you stop yourself doing that thing? And then I want to talk about, uh, finally, I want to talk about this, um, this uh, what I call technology-mediated reflection, which is these technologies which allow us to scrutinize and better understand our pasts. OK, so uh, I'll be talking about those different types of outputs as, as I go along. OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is life logging. And I guess I gave you the kind of T-shirt, shirt slogan version of it. So basically, the life logging vision says, what if we could automatically save records of every single bit of information we ever touched, every event we experienced, our reactions to those events, so, you, know, you know, like sensors that do um, you know, pulse or skin conductivity, that's emotion detection. There are a bunch of uh, you know, startups that are selling that type of technology now. So we have potentially all this information. You know, one way of thinking about it is it's like a Facebook timeline on steroids about ourselves, all this extra information. So what if we had access to all that information? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Because, quotes, we would never forget anything. So um, I photoshopped that. I'll just be clear about that. That is not a member of the royal family behaving that way. OK, so the, the idea behind this is that we have a complete and accurate digital record. We'll never miss a thing. And the notion is that in some way, our wetware, our brains are, you know, they are substandard. They need to be fixed. So what we're going to do is add all this additional data, and then we solve the problem. OK, so I just want to talk about um, one study and a couple of pieces of technology in this context. And so we asked this basic question, which, it, which, which I guess now in the era of Google Glass, this stuff was done about five years ago, is becoming more pertinent. So the question you can ask is, excuse me, what happens if we have amazingly rich records of our everyday lives? Can we actually remember more stuff? And if so, how, how do we do that kind of thing? I'm not going to talk about ethical questions in this context. I'm happy to talk about those those afterwards, but that's not really what I major on. OK, so we did a study with SenseCam. How many people here are familiar with SenseCam? Right, OK, so it's, it's basically it's a, a product that was developed by Microsoft, and it's a sensor-driven camera. So you wear it here around your neck. I'll show you outputs in a minute. Uh, it's got a fisheye lens, and um, it, the, it triggers it takes an image every time there's a change in light, there's a temperature change, or there's a motion change. So basically, if I walked out of that door, it would sense my motion, take a bunch of images then. As if I stepped outside, the light would change, another image would be taken. And what the result of this usually is, if you're wearing one for, let's say, um, you know, normal, I, I, I guess about 14, 13, 14 waking hours, you've got about 7,000 images. Right, depending on your activity level. You know, it can be as low as three, but you know, around 7,000. And what we did then was, because this is like prehistoric times, we uh, separately, this is a Garmin GPS, but we wanted to co-index it to um, location. 
So we've now got images that are basically co-indexed to location. So we know where you were when an image was, uh, when a, a photo was taken. So um, I'm just going to show you what the outputs are like. So um, I'm going to show you this, and then I'll ask you kind of what you think was going on, right? But this is the output. Remember, it's a fisheye camera. It's worn around the neck. Isn't this cool? Okay, so um, let's see how much you know. That's a view into somebody else's life, right? Obviously, she agreed. Oh, gave one away. I was going to ask you the gender. But you could have all told me that, right? Because how do you know that person's female? The bracelet on. The bracelet, yeah. Anything else? She's shopping. She's shopping. Right, I guess there are. We could think of an account by which that was a guy, but and unlikely. You both, right? Yeah, right. Um, okay, anything else that you can say about that? Where did that person live? Did they live here? No, you're in. Okay, any more ideas? There isn't. You could have told more precisely yet. Netherlands? No, close. No, no. Yeah, okay, that, that right. So she's actually biking on the left side of the road. So that's, there's only one solution to that particular conundrum, right? Um, yeah, so anybody want to tell me anything else about that person that you saw? That was <coughs> interesting. Late 20s. Good. How do you know that? <laughs> the peer she was hanging out with. Oh, I guess, yes, right, right. So they like a drink, right, because they had two separate, uh, uh, two alcoholic drinks in that time, right? Greek food, you wouldn't have got that. That's reversed. Sign. But anyway, so what you can see with this technology is potentially just with this kind of sensor-driven camera, like something that you could have with Google Glass, you know, you've got these apparently amazingly very, very rich records uh, of what's going on. So anybody, any questions about that? Yeah. But it seems really limited usefulness unless you, you, you can actually process the information. Right? Okay, let's come to that. Hold that thought. Okay, so... So our question, so we basically build, uh, built an interface where you could kind of fast forward and stop through your day, right? And we, our questions, our research questions in deploying that, and I'll show you some other interfaces to it, are does this type of life logging help memory? How does it help? So questions we can ask are can people remember more events from their past? Can they remember more details? Then we can ask a question, you see, one of the things that I think a lot of people get wrong about, quotes, digital memory is that these are kind of external indices. They are cues to help us remember. These aren't the memories themselves. So said a different way, you might have forgotten that you went out to dinner with that person, but just seeing that image might actually remind you about it, right? So that's a cue to help you remember. It's that the digital stuff is, is a cue that will actually uh, engender or improve your memory. So I'm sure you've all had the experience of, you know, looking at old photos with a friend um, or a family member, and you know, you're in the photo, you have no memory of it, right? But you know you must have been there because you can kind of see yourself in the picture, right? So there's this reconstructive element which these types of technologies um, bring. So the other thing we're interested in is people's emotional reactions. Um, to uh, seeing these types of pictures. So classically, you think about social settings, uh, photo sharing is a classically social um, exercise where people, you know, it engenders positive emotions and bonds between friends uh, and family members. Okay, so we did a study where people, they wear the sense cam, they have the Garmin, they wore it for 18, uh, they wore it for two weeks, and uh, five weeks later, we tested their recall, and we used the classic um, psychological, oh, oh, sorry. Um, we had four different interfaces, because we're interested in um, 
de various different types of, of ways that you can actually represent the information. So this is me with wetware. So one control condition is I get no technology. Another uh, condition for retrieval is we're going to ask you a question about what you remember uh, in a day. All you have is GPS information. Uh, another setting is the top one there called snaps. All you have there is just those images that I showed you with a way to kind of fast forward and stop through your day. And then this is a combination of those two which whereby you can basically click on a location, you can see the image, right? So we've co-indexed those two, right? And we ask the question, you know, how do those different type of interfaces, how do they uh, promote recall? So the basic question we ask people, uh, we ask them um, about a particular half day, and this is a typical question that's used by psychologists to probe how much people can remember about past incidents. So I might say to somebody, what did you do? Where did you go? And who did you meet on, you know, whatever, instantiating that uh, Monday morning, December the 16th, which is a day for which they have data. Uh, sorry, half day for which they have data, right? And then when they've told the story, right, so they can use the technology if that's the condition they're in. If they're in the wetware condition, they just have to try and remember. And then we ask, uh, once they've done their uh, recall, we ask them a question, which is, you know, do you, do you, did you literally remember it, right? Did you see it in your mind's eye? Or is it this situation like the one I told you about the old photographs? Is it one where you see the thing and you kind of know that you must have been there? You can kind of infer that that's an event that you participated in, but you don't actually literally have a memory of it. So, for example, that person might see themselves in that restaurant, they might see their hands there, and they might know that they were there, but they don't have, you know, they don't have a, a, the feeling, they can't see that event in their mind's eye. And the last one is, you know, like plain guesswork. And then we give them a simple linear scale where we ask them to rate their happiness, you know, how they felt, you know, when they saw that sequence of images uh, associated with uh, that particular myth. That's, that's right. What you feel now about that event. Okay, so we're, one of the, 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 the thing that we're looking at then is the number of events where an event could be for you guys going to class, you know, driving the kids to school, going out to lunch. And then, so an events can also have attributes. So we're scoring the raw number of events and also um, you know, these attribute properties of them. Okay, so in this setting, whatever technology you condition you're in, you know, it could be one of those four, yet as long as you like to look at your life log or other, you know, if it's GPS, to look at that log. Um, and the question we ask ourselves is, compared with wetware, how many extra events do you think you'll be able to recall? So this is a group exercise for all of us. You know, so just think, you know, if, if the total recall, if life logging, if that intuition is correct, you know, you would think it would be kind of about this order, right? You think about your calendar? Yeah, Terry. I was yeah. trying to think about how we'd respond. What do you say, what do you coach them on to be an event? So I can say, I got up in the morning, put my feet on the floor, I took three steps, I walked toward the bathroom, I walked into the bathroom, I opened the toilet. I mean, I could give you 50 events before I got out of the bathroom. If I define event that way. So we kind of coach them to be the, whoops, gave the game away. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, whoops. So we give them these types of examples. So it has to be kind of extended. It, it can't be at this, this kind of micro level. It has to be something that's extended over minutes. So we give them examples of this, right? And this is what they do in the psychological studies when they're uh, testing autobiographical memory. But I guess looking at my watch is not an example of an event, but going to a meeting might be having a coffee, um, you know, um, I don't know, going out for a meal. These are all uh, kind of event types. They're extended over time. They're the kind of things, as I say, that you might calendar, right? I should say that people didn't have a, it, it's in, people didn't, I, I understand logically and philosophically, have we got any, philo, philo, I mean, of course, philosophers are going to kill us for talking this way, but 
But in ordinary language, people respond in, in kind of the right way. OK, so this to us was, so this, if you remember, it's asked about a half day. So we were kind of pretty surprised at this, right? So what we're saying is you get like about 3.5 extra events boost per day through using this type of technology, right? So you can remember three extra things that you did. And what's kind of very interesting to us down here is that uh, that's not statistically significantly different. So just looking at a bunch of images is no better than, you know, just, you know, trying to remember it, you know, trying to remember it out of your own head. And I should say we're not alone in doing this. Uh, Abby Sellen's group also got very, very similar results when they ran a very similar study. So what's going on? Why is this so bad? Why, why don't we get total recall? I did. Can you say a little bit more about how they use the technology? So how they would do retrieval in that case. Yeah. yeah. So so basically, we'd ask. So, so let's say you've got the full, you know, full uh, ball of wax, right? So you've got time stamp. Sorry, you've got the GPS and you've got the images. So I might ask you that question, and then what people would typically do is they kind of fast forward through as we just did there, you know, and they'd say, oh, okay, I guess that was the day when I left work early, right? And I decided to, I was going to look, I needed to pick up some shoes, or I thought I'd seen this cute pair of shoes, I thought I'd go and look at them again, you know, and I, th I thought I'd look at those dresses, right? I'd do some clothes shopping before I met X, right? And, and then, so, so then they would, might be flipping in and out, so they might be looking at the map of Cambridge, so they might see themselves kind of traversing in a Cambridge, you know, having cycled you know, so GPS tells you your mode of transport as well, implicitly. So, so that's the way they use it. Yeah. I'm trying to understand this graph because if I read it the way it looks, it says that given just memory, people remember only one event every three days. No, no, no. They that's it. So the mean number of events recalled must be something other than what it says. And this is averaged across. So that's correct. Your interpretation is absolutely correct. So most of the time, when we say to people, you know, if I was to say to you, hey, Terry, what did you do, you know, and I don't put you on the spot, but, what, you know, what were you doing on, you know, uh, February the 26th, assuming that's not your birthday or, you know, your wife's birthday, yeah, in the morning? You say, I don't know. If you tell me it's a Tuesday, then I can give you some. Yeah, but, okay, well, well, we'll come back to that in a sec, because that's positive. <laughs> yeah, so anybody else? Well, so, uh, building on that, I'm wondering... So even in the best case, people are remembering one and three quarters events on average. On a half day. Yeah. So that's oh, it's a half day. Yes, yeah, so that's a half day. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So this is the half day result. So All that's right. why I've multiplied it by. So basically, this is saying on a day, I, I get two thirds of it. You know, so I get two events every three days just from my own. Okay. That right. Yes. Okay. okay. So, so let's say it's three and a half events. I day. should obviously rescale this graph. Yeah. That's causing a lot of confusion. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry. The question was actually, I'm curious what the ground truth is at some level. Right. So, so, so I guess we have not followed people around, but I think your calendar is not a bad proxy for, you know, what the best, and it may not be, you know, that may be an undershoot for what your number of events actually is. Is, it like, is this a third of what we do? Is this 90%? Oh, I see what you said. Yeah. So, are we so, pretty good or are we pretty bad? So, so, so I, I think this is not good. Um, and I think it's, yeah. Well, it's certainly compared with the lifelonging vision, you know, so our, we're expecting like 15 extra, right? And we're, we're, we're just surprised not to see that. Yeah. Sorry, your information <laughs> might just be, we're boring. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. no, 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 no. So, so this is a question about that. If yeah. you get contemporaneous okay. logging, so yeah. I went through my day and logged, yeah. what is the baseline number you would get from that? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. And I'm saying the calendar, we have not done that, but I think the calendar is not a bad proxy, which would basically, you know, so you think, right, my calendar usually, I've got probably about six or seven calendar events, and then I've got family stuff around it, right? So, you know, that's maybe not bad. Yeah. And so how much of this is... I just have, I can't tell which day I should Got be it. Right, good, okay, okay. 
So we ask people after they've done all that, right? So this is kind of important to understand because it tells us something about memory as well. Okay, so we ask people about that. We're saying, you know, we didn't say you're absolutely crap, but we said, you know, you seem not to be, you know. Do. So what's, what's going on here? And then the first point is your point, which is like, there's so many images, right? How do I deal with all this stuff, right? And then this other point, which is just everybody, you know, so I, I always, any, anything I do, I always do myself first, right? And I was kind of a bit down when I saw how much of my life I'm in front of a bloody computer, right? But I don't know which, you know, so if you were to show, which day is that? I don't know. That's a meeting. I'm meeting, like say I'm meeting Michael. You know, if that's a if that's a one-on-one -on -one weekly, I don't know which one it is, right? So, so part of the problem here is, and that's kind of a, a, a classic attribute of human memory, is it moves from being very, very highly specific. So you have these one-off events, which is kind of the way that we tend to think about how memory is. But a lot of it's kind of boring stuff. And the way that human memory works is it kind of evolves a script across. It abstracts out. And you know, if that's a one-on-one, -on -one, they all elide into each other, right? One faculty meeting. One class is, you know, the first class is exciting, but then they begin to elide. It's an instance of a type, and you don't have a lot of instantiations of, of, of different details. And that's the problem that people are running into with it. Okay. So, you know, then we looked at other... So this is attributes. So once you're talking about a, an event, then, um, you know, one question we can ask is what kind of... Which of the interfaces help you get kind of more details? And the snaps, you know, for fairly obvious reasons, they help you get more details about an event. So people say things like, I found the SenseCamp pitch is really useful for those micro events that happen those days. So once you've got the event, you can kind of read out from it. Yeah. The, the snap tracks actually hide some of the photos. Why would people do worse? Good. Right. We, we misdesigned the interface, right? Because you had to key off, you had to key off location to get to image. And I think that. It sh we should just have had those kind of be simultaneous, right? So that's, I think that's a piece of misdesign, but well spotted, yeah. Okay, and then the, this other question I talk talked about earlier, which is this recon, so we basically say to people, you know, remember this thing is like, did you see it in your mind's eye, or were you kind of guessing it, right? And so what we see, uh, yeah, sorry, reconstructing it, so you look at that thing, you say, what must have been happening? Right? And so what you see is with these location-based technologies, people are doing more of this kind of inferencing. So they're saying, where was I? Oh, I'm going to kind of work out what I was doing. Right? Um, you know, so this is this interesting, cool one, which is about kind of speed of travel. Snaps made me, uh, made me remember. Snap tracks and tracks, those location-based, made me figure out something which must have happened in a particular way. For example, I must have gone home by taxi. Right, so this person, they're used to seeing those pins spaced in a particular way because they walk or take a bike, right? And suddenly they see themselves doing these traversals of distance very quickly, so they make an inference, right? And they've got an image of themselves inside a car, so they, they sort of see that. Okay, and then we, we also, and this is completely consistent with the psychological literature, which says that um, if you can see something in your mind's eye, not all memories are actually visual, but a lot of autobiographical ones are, there's emotion associated with them. Um, organic memory, that's the, you know, uh, that's wetware, was useless. I could have no emotional attachment to those memories. But the tools, especially snaps, I guess meaning images across both conditions, were very good at reviewing accurate memories. So people kind of feel more positive about these things. OK, so um, this is kind of, I'm going to, terminate the first part of the talk. Um, so what I'm trying to argue here is that a rich record doesn't necessarily guarantee total recall. And part of the problem is that a lot of these images can be confusable. Uh, and that might relate to kind of the hab habitual nature of our lives. Um, that these memories are often reconstructive. So that's say you're using the digital as a set of cues to reconstruct. And these pictures are very evocative, right? Now, I don't really want to go into a big technical digression, because I kind of want to move on to the next conceptual point. 
But one of the questions which I guess you over there, I don't know your name, I'm sorry, we're, we're talking about how can we process these. And in particular, one of the big problems is over generation, right? So we have, I want to talk really quickly about two ideas. One idea is co-indexing co by attention or user action. So here's a simple example, uh, and Michael will be totally familiar with this because it's like the one eye technical idea I've ever had, which is like, if somebody takes a note or somebody takes a picture, we can infer actively that they're interested in something. So what if we could co-index those actions onto you know, that stream of pictures, then we could infer that those things were kind of more important. Um, so that's one way. So that's kind of co-indexing, say, off sensors. And then the other way, which we actually built a couple of systems to do, was if somebody repeatedly accesses the same image, we're going to infer it's important, right? Just because they've looked at it multiple times. So um, one of the systems we built um, basically used this idea, and we use it in two sensors. We can make, we can do, so basically, frequently retrieved and popular pictures, we use those as cues to import, and you're, Michael, totally familiar with this, right? This kind of crowdsourcing, so it's like individual crowds. So if I multiply, if I access an image multiple times, I'm gonna infer that's more important, and in our UI, it grows, right? So this is like manga style, it grows. The more you access it, the bigger it looks, and the more salient it's supposed to be, right? But also, we can crowdsource that, and we built a kind of lecture deployment which you're seeing here, which is across a class, right? You can, if I see, if, if multiple people access the same image across a class like this, if we, if we had this type of technology deployed in this type of class, then these more popular images would be seen as kind of more important in that context. So those are two ways to kind of get ourselves out of this trap of overgeneration. It's to try and use people's actions as indicators or proxies for importance. Okay, so, so I now want to kind of revisit this idea about kind of fixing memory, right? So the life logging vision, it basically says, memory's broken, here comes technology to the rescue. Well, what if we try to take a slightly different perspective, right? So instead of trying to fix organic memory by recording everything, what if we try to emulate in some ways? Okay, so let's just, I'll give you a quick, tiny tour of how human autobiographical memory works in practice. So these are some of the arguments. One argument is that forgetting is, is adaptive, right? So simple example, when you go out to the car park looking for your car, you don't want to remember every single instance of when you ever parked that car be kind of nice if you forgot all the previous ones, right? So that's a simple example. So one th that's one argument about adaptivity of forgetting. Um, there's also um, something called positivity bias, which says, and, and I'll show you the, uh, the data on this in a second, that one of the things that we as people do is we forget negative or upsetting things. Okay, so, you know, Quick kind of uh, whiz through uh, memory and emotion, right? So there's a lot of, so you can ask people about their past using a variety of different methods. You can ask them to journal. You can ask them to talk about big salient events from their past, whatever you want to do. There's a repeated result, which is people remember twice as many positive as negative events, right? And I guess neutral comes in about 30%. So that's one thing that people do, right? The second thing, really interesting result, is this thing called the fading affect bias, right? And I've tried to depict it here. What, so, if something happens to us and we think about it again, generally the affect that we have that's associated with that drops. So here's a highly positive event, right? The one's in yellow. We rethink it, it drops over time. So, you know, you just won the lottery, you think about it again, you're not going to be as positive as that first moment when that thing happened. Right? So that's the fading affect bit. Now the bias bit. Here are negative events, right? Negative events fade much more quickly, right? Faster regression to the mean than positive events. So what's the, what does this mean? It means that if something really bad happens to you, then you kind of get over it more quickly 
than if something really good happens to you and you, that starts slowly attenuating, right? So emotional, general emotional strength drops, the negative drops faster, right? And I'm gonna talk about that a bit more with our system later. The other thing which is kind of cute is this thing called the rosy view, which is that we tend to kind of edit out the negative, right? So there's these really cool studies where they do things like they ask people about vacations, right? Uh, you know, both at the time and afterwards. So they would have people logging a vacation and they'd have them, you know, on the plane, right? And so what people's accounts say on the plane, so let's say we're going to Disneyland, right? On the plane and people are saying things like, there's this really fat person next to me. God, their elbows are really poking into me, right? At the time. So you say, what's your affect like right now? And they say it's, it's about a five on a scale of one to 10, right? I'm looking forward to being there, but this is a painless flight, right? You ask them about that part of the trip afterwards, it's a seven, right? So we edit out, you know, so you ask Disney, you know, Disney World or whatever, right? You look at their logs, they're not, you know, at the time they're talking about, oh my God, look at these lines, right? I can't believe that, you know, you know, uh, 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 you know, a thousand people are waiting for Pirates of the Caribbean, right? And then you ask them about, you know, how they felt a month or two later, fantastic, right? So that's one thing, that's, so this is another way that we're basically self-editing. So we edit out, you know, the negative or annoying details. Okay, so now what we wanted to do is we want to take these kind of ideas into a context, into the digital context, because it starts to get a little bit different in the digital context, because what we have in the digital context is kind of like it's veridical, right? So if you go onto Facebook and you say, God, X is really pissing me off, right? You know, and you look at that three weeks later, it's not suddenly got to being, gosh, what a good friend X is, right? Which is what human memory might say, because it's right there, right? So you've kind of logged it. Okay, so this is, so we're interested in exploring this because this is, this is a situation where we may not want perfect recall. Okay, so very quickly on breakup and memory. So the things that we tend to remember are aligned with our self-concept, right? Those are the things we remember best. One of the problems with breakup is, you know, your relationship is kind of very much part of your identity. What people tend to do in a relationship breakup situation is they kind of redefine themselves, and then there's a problem because their new self isn't triggering the right set of memories. So, um, as a British person, I love this idea. There's this mechanism which is called selective repression. You know, as a British person, we never want to talk about negative stuff. We never, we just never bring it up, right? So that's the mechanism that's been argued is, is helpful in this context. Okay, so we did, so the idea behind this study is to try and understand this a situation where people may, quotes, want to forget, and then what we want to do is we want to think about designs that might follow from understanding that situation well. So we have 24 digital natives, you know, so these are people who are kind of living online, um, and they had to experience a recent breakup following a long-term relationship. Okay, so here are some of the problems with digital records, which, you know, you guys will be just totally familiar with, right? So there's a bunch of stuff that we have, you know, on our personal systems, which is like super evocative, right? So we've all got personal, you know, whether this is on, uh, you know, when I say personal, I mean it could be on the cloud as part of our account, right? But music's very evocative, we've got our personal photos, and obviously stuff we do on the social networking site, it's all kind of, uh, it engenders emotions. The other characteristic of, of it is, it's kind of ubiquitous, that's to say we're always kind of encountering it, right? So it's, you know, it's part of our stuff, you know, you go into Facebook, you see this, you go into your file system, you go into your email, you're constantly being reminded of significant people in your life. Right? The other thing is most people's stuff is not particularly well organized, so it's kind of hard to compartmentalize stuff if you actually wanted to do that. The other thing, final thing, is kind of highly available, right? So people we found out have very different strategies on this, right? So you can unfriend, right? But if you choose not to unfriend, then it's very, very easy these days to find out exactly what your ex is doing just with one click, right? And we did have people in the study who would unfriend people and then they would go to their 
friend's house, log into their friend, you know, their friend, they say, I need to look at your Facebook account because you're still friends with my ex, and then they'd look. Right? So the problem is this information is just so much more accessible. Okay. So, you know, life's now online in a serious way. So in this situation, we're often one click away from highly upsetting information. So, you know, people say, I miss him. His uploads on Facebook make me feel hurt. What hurts are pictures with his new friends and experiences because I can see him, but I can't talk to him, right? And we know there's a bunch of stuff on Facebook in, and relationships which says it's very, Facebook's very misleading because there's no context for posts, right? Stuff goes up and you don't know the context. So there's a lot of misinterpretation. Then this point I already made, that it's very easy because our personal stuff is a mess, it's very easy to accidentally encounter highly obsessing information. There are some songs that recall feelings from that period, I listen to them, and this hinders moving on. Pictures always make me remember a good memory, so I try not to look at them at all, because good memories also link to a bad memory. Okay, so that was, then we started looking at what people did with this stuff, right? And we found, you know, crudely, that there were three ways that people dealt with this situation. So some, you know, and you can maybe think about people's real life strategies to relationships. So we got three types. You know, one, some people like, it's over, they try and trash everything immediately. Then there are some other people who keep everything, right? And we'll talk about how they deal with it. And then we've got people who are kind of more, uh, I guess, strategic about when and what they delete. So I'm just going to talk through those people, right? You know, so some people, they just say, it's over, right? Having photos on my phone and computer did cause me to feel sad, but I immediately removed them all after the breakup in order to move on, right? Of course, there are problems with this, right? You know, because, you know, if you immediately delete everything out of a relationship, you're kind of, you, at the time, you might feel it's, it's, a, it's like a negative event, but if you, when you think back, when you kind of got through it, you can't kind of write off three years of your life. You can't say there was nothing valuable there. So when people feel better about it, they want to salvage something, but then they've trashed everything. So people say, some books and music will continue to remind me of him. I can keep those because I felt it would not be productive for my attempts to move on. Now I wish I'd kept them. Okay, so here's the other type, right? I kept everything, right? And this can be quite disruptive. Pictures hindered my moving on. When I looked at them, uh, at them, it would make me remember him. I just try not to look at them. But at the very beginning of the breakup, I looked at them frequently. Those possessions didn't help me. Right? So this is the kind of immediate accessibility problem. OK, and then we've got the, <laughs> I love this. I just love this, right? So, so, so then we've got some people who are kind of thinking about it, right? So then they do this kind of, you know, technical stuff where they might create a hidden folder. They might kind of, and, and this is a problem, you know, for a, you know, if I want to find all the stuff about X and put it in one location, that's a tricky thing to do, right? So I deleted all the message, I backed them up, I put all the digital material into a file, I set it as hidden, right? People might hide stuff on their old phone. And then this is getting to, getting to be super interesting, right? So they appoint gatekeepers. So they might give them the memories. They might give them the US, USB or the old laptop or whatever and say, don't let me have that, right? Kind of interesting. So we'll come to the designs in a minute. But that's kind of starting to get really interesting. OK, so then um, the, the selective people are doing something in between. I actually had a little cleanup there, deleted a bunch of emails I had from her cleared all her stuff off my computer and deleted my number from her phone, but I kept her photos. Someday I might want to revisit some of the times we share, just not right now. Yeah? I guess an obvious other disposal strategy would, the, would be to have a time limit, right? So you have some... Yeah, that's, yeah, so, right, exactly. That's, that, yeah, that's great. Okay, so it just wanted, we have not built these systems, but actually, anybody here know Kill Switch? So kill switch is like a startup that says they, it, it's for the deleters, right? So you sign up, and the idea is, you know, I'm not sure technically how it does it, because I think it's technically it's a really difficult problem to say, find me all information about X, right? And then harvest it in a particular place and trash it, 
right? So I could see within the scope of particular applications you could do that. But anyway, this is the way this product, yeah. Sorry, is this on my laptop or if like you and I are together and then you break up with me, I can kill switch like your own? No, you can't kill switch. You can kill your own possessions or your own accounts, which, are, and it's, it's a product. I, I just, I mean, it's being sold, but it's the usual, I don't know whether it does, because I, I can't technically work out how it could do what it's kind of projected to do, right? I, I mean, certainly not completely, right? So you could see if you've labeled all your photos in the right kind of way and, you know, been very good about tagging, then it would have a chance, but, you know, I just don't see it somehow. Anyway, but that's, so one idea which, you know, which is, I guess you could partially get there, is to start thinking about technologies like entity recognition. You know, so could you kind of extract references to that person, you know, and names, you know, and collect all that stuff together? Um, I guess the, the technologies I found more interesting, the designs I found more interesting in this context were along the lines that you were suggesting, which is once you've kind of got a lot of that stuff together, which, as I say, is kind of a difficult technical problem in, in and of itself, there are things that you might want to do to kind of stop you immediately accessing it, right? Because one of the things that one person talked to us about was like the drunken phone call, right? And this, you know, so it's like you have the contact number, you know, you're in a poor state emotionally, you can't stop yourself, right? So what these uh, types of designs might do is if all that material is in a location that's kind of, you have a timeout, right? So you, you could set some parameter which says, you know, I'm not, you know, I may express a desire to do this, but I can't execute on it for 24 hours, right? Till I'm sober, for example, right? So that might be, or, you know, you could have the gatekeeper, which is that person owns it and we have to have a, chi we have to have a chat before, you know, there has to be an exchange of info before they'll kind of give me, you know, the key and I can get in. The other one was physical distance, which is that you could, which some people did, which is they took that laptop and they gave it, put it in a, a physically different location. So all those things might cause, you know, might help you do the impulse control by making it really difficult to kind of follow through on this kind of self-destructive urge. And then there's these other things which we didn't really see I mean, I guess those um, kind of uh, selective disposers, so a lot of the, uh, I guess, the relationship literature talks about the need to kind of extract and process aspects of that, um, you know, set of possessions you had together. Um, so we, you know, we're interested in technologies that would actually allow you, for example, to you know, make some kind of album or something, you know, but to creatively process that, because that's meant to be very healing. Okay, so those, those are not built, um, you know, but they are design ideas that we're really interested in exploring. Okay, so um, anybody, any questions about that? By the way, this went viral on the, on the internet. I had so many, you know, like people, I guess, people want to know Facebook's really bad for us, so uh, yeah. To link it to another project, like you know, uh, if you can keep that closed or locked that file, I mean, locked for a couple of time, and you can like link it to lose your weight, something like that. Mm -hmm. That <laughs> yeah, that reminds yeah, yeah. me. Right, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, exactly yeah. have a yeah, project, yeah. like yes. if you can every day you can keep your phone like on the table for ten minutes. Then UNICEF will donate. Yeah. I think right. one dollar or something yes. to. Yeah, no, yeah, some, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you could get that sort of, uh, I guess, and there's a reverse. You know, if you can, uh, you know, if you don't stay off that, I give $50 to the Republican Party. That, you know, there's the, you can have them work both ways, right? Okay, and, and, and then this, this, was, this was an idea that some of, so this is in the spirit of kind of actively, physically processing uh, this stuff. Okay, and then the last thing, um, which I guess Facebook weren't very responsive to, was, you know, so at the moment, um, you know, what Facebook is, is, is kind of weird. I mean, it's, it's a friend's site, but it's not a good site for managing your relationships through because there's no notion of kind of tying your stuff together to another person's, right? So people talk about a lot of problems where their really 
private, personal stuff was under somebody else's control. And the so we had ideas that you might actually have, like, um, a, you know, there'd be a special area of Facebook which was about, you know, close relationships, which for relationships which were moving positively could be used for celebration, right? And then if things did go wrong, then you could have something that was closer to the kind of kill switch facility, but basically you wouldn't have this problem of kind of managing your relationship through all these different kind of proxy type links, complex proxy type links. Anyway, I did not get much traction in, in conversations with, with Facebook about that. Okay, so, um, so, so this is a different approach. Um, I talked about the value of adaptive uh, forgetting, um, distinct strategies for disposal of, of digital possessions, and some design implications uh, for doing digital disposal. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about today is some recent work we've been doing on, I guess, reflection, which is kind of trying to think deeply about digital records and how this relates to, to well-being, excuse me. So um, we're, we're trying to, in, in, so I guess there's a, this whole quantified self movement, which is like, have data about yourself, understand yourself, right? So we're in this area, but what we want to do is we want to provide ways to use these types of personal records to kind of better understand ourselves. So let me talk about, and we're interested in the emotions realm, right? So one of the problems that we have as people is this problem that we call emotion pattern detection, right? So, you know, so let me show you this example. This is from one of our users who used our system for about a year, and this is like, this is her days of the week, right? So what this shows you is that she's pretty happy on a Monday. She's terrible on a... She's I guess this moment, no, 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 that's Sunday, this is Thursday, right? So she gets sadder during the week, and, but you won't be too surprised about that, but she didn't know it, right? So that's an example of an emotional pattern which these types of systems are actually going to yield up to us, and I'll show you a few more of these kind of things later. So what we can do, so as I say, in our lives, the connection between things that happen to us, things we do, and our emotional reactions are quite complex, if we can kind of record and kind of externalize and visualize those connections, we can better understand ourselves and we can kind of proceed adaptively. So if we like things, we can seek them out. If, if we don't like things, you know, we can seek to avoid them. Um, and I'm going to talk, what we found really interesting about the deployment of this system is that people are actually using it for kind of behavior change, which is they were using it to monitor things they were doing that made them kind of unhappy and using the system to actually change those behaviors. Okay, so what I've shifted to now talking about is not just remembering stuff, but reconstruct. And I want to really quickly talk about some, I think, fascinating uh, research on emotional writing, which is us talking about and reprocessing our past. So I guess you know this, right? This, isn't this just fascinating? Okay, so what Penny Baker does is he has people journal. Say, say you're really upset about something, right? What he has people do is repeatedly write about that event, right? And this is the kind of thing that happens, right? So there's now over 200 studies with this kind of reflection on your negative past. So what the, effect, the effects you get are reduced medical visits, improved immune response, better grades, re-employment, reduced absenteeism, increased subjective well-being, increased working memory, right? And the argument behind this is that what this type of exercise allows people to do is to distance themselves from negative events, but also to see themselves as a kind of hero in their own narrative in which they've kind of, they've uh, accomplished, they, they've got past some very negative past event. So they say, you know, some terrible stuff has happened to me, but I feel good about that event now, because that's what happens if you repeatedly write about it, and so I feel good about it now. Therefore, I'm some person who can cope with past negative events. Now, I told you about 10 minutes ago that one of the things our memories do is 
edit out negative events, so they're not doing anything fantastic, we aren't doing, but this is how people feel. They take a positive message from this situation, which is, I'm feeling much better about it now, therefore, I'm resilient. Okay, and also you can get the same kind of benefits, but a bit reduced. So if you, if you think about positive things that have happened to you, so this is like the, you know, sharing photos, uh, you know, experience, you know, you look at family photos, you share stuff on Facebook, you know, generally if it's a social event, you feel better. And there's a bunch of literature, not as strong events as, as with the negative past, but still um, good effects. Okay, so we wanted to explore these ideas with a system because we think Penny Baker, this type of thing can be done much better with a system, right? Because if you've got a mobile app, that you can kind of log events on and rewrite about, so you can log them at the time. That's really how you felt, right? Also, we can have the system actively present those back to you. So in the Penny Baker style, you have to kind of get your paper log out, you have to make sure you find a time in the day to kind of go back and you know, write about that past negative event. What our system does is it presents them back to you, both positive and negative, and asks you about how you're thinking about them now. So it's pretty easy for you to log things that are happening to you, I guess more veridically, because you log them, you know, and there's, I guess now there's no, there's no, you know, people are using their phones all the time, right? So it's not like, what's that person doing? They could be texting, right? The fact they happen to be logging their life is, yeah. information on how much logging is natural for people? Because you ask them to log a lot of information. But at what point did that become laborious or... Um, I think um, we have about 16% um, of people are quite happy to do this, and I would say are kind of active journalists, right? So we don't have to pay them anything. A lot of the study, I'm, we give people like a, you know, 20 to, depending on their, uh, a 20 to $50 uh, incentive. To be, so it's a lot of work, but we wanted to make sure that we could see the effects of it, right? So I think, I think the whole question about, um, you know, whether compliance with all these, all health applications is, is a big one. This one I'd say about 16% of people are doing it naturally. What's really interesting to me is there's a kind of paradox because I can, at, at our exit interviews, people are saying, tell me how great this system is. I say, do you want to keep it? They say yes, and then I, you know, I get back in touch four months later you know, I've seen, I can make them happier objectively, they think they're happier, they stop using it, right? But that's human, you know, we all know there's a bunch of things we can do to, you know, be better people and healthier people, but we don't do them, right? Okay, so um, this is, what you basically do is, um, and I'll put the, we, these are both free, downloadable, Android, iPhone, right? I'll, I'll finish with those links. I'd love, if you want to use them, fantastic. Okay. Um, you journal any daily event, you emotionally rate it, we just play it back to you, you know, like, um, so this is, um, you know, one of our long-term users, one event from three, oh, you take a photo, evocative too, an event from three years ago, so she can now reflect on that one, two years ago, one year ago, one month ago, right? So you're just logging as many most people, most of our long-term users, they're doing like two or three a day. And then, you know, forever, however long, we've got some not very clever algorithm which presents stuff back to you, which is normally like a month later, a year later, because there is, there is something to kind of calendar cyclicity. Okay, so let me just, uh, so this, you create an entry this way, take a photo. I want to get to the data, and I'm a bit concerned about time here. So let me just whiz through. So um, what we did was a kind of a classic intervention study. We measure people's well-being, you know, using standard scales. Then we have um, three different conditions. Uh, record and reflect is our ecosystem. Record is we just have them record events. That's so you don't see them back. Um, and then we have a bunch of controls, which were an absolute pig to run, but I don't really want to get into. So, um, you know, recorders, uh, you know, they, that's what they're doing. Reflectors, they get, they see the events multiple times. Everybody understand that difference? Okay. Um, so these are the well-being scores, and um, all of these groups, surprisingly to us, both recorders and reflectors, 
they improve their subjective well-being, and our, the controls are, are flat. I can show you that data in, in a sec if you're interested. And then we did, um, we did textual analyses of the logs, which they shared with us. So everybody gets a chance to edit their logs and share or not share, because this is private stuff. And then we did textual analysis, because we wanted to see what were the kind of ways that people are talking about their emotions that, would, that were kind of correlated with improvements of well-being. And what we saw was the people are just recording, they're using the system very differently from the people who are reflecting. Um, you know, so people are recording, they're talking about relationships, reflectors are talking about actions, and they're, uh, they're often future directed. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that. You know, so recorders analyze their life, especially their relationships. The reflectors report on their activities, but later drew lessons when they had perspective, both from positive and negative events. So um, I'm not going to dwell on that. This is, yeah, this is one person just reflecting on her attitudes to men, and you know, I guess these are eternal gender issues. Okay, so um, so this is how you can kind of use the uh, the study to kind of reflect on uh, emotional habits. I'm kind of getting worried about my assignment because there are some questions, items on there that I don't know how to do or answer. I'm afraid I won't get full credit. So she's got a sick. She's not amazingly happy about it, right? You know, I'm starting to realize that so long as we do a decent job on the assignments, we get full credit, so I don't feel like I should stress so much. So she's thinking about that past event. Although her score hasn't increased, she's getting happier about it. Or, I mean, in her text, she's getting happier. Here's another one. This person's really unhappy. I should say that one is the unhappiest you could be. My boyfriend's not texting me often enough. <laughs> Frowny. I really wish he would text me more often. Right? And then, I'm sorry you can't read this probably. I guess I'm not that angry. I, I'm sure I can at times be that crazy girlfriend who texts too much and is overbearing, so I'm sure he can get annoyed too. Right? So um, I guess I elided this. But she's gone up to about a five here. So she's thought about her behave, past behavior and kind of got happier about it. So this is the way that they're using the system a lot of the time. OK, so I'm not going to have time. I just want to make sure. So this is learning from positive. So one question that we had you know, was, we're actually messing with memory here. So the point I, I made at the, the outset was, you know, what people are now seeing is actually how they felt, warts and all, about past events. but you know, so what the technology is showing us is what we actually thought at the time, but nevertheless, we're still getting these positive effects. So even though you can see literally how you felt at the time, right, so this is not edited memory like we usually get, but you still get these well-being effects. So I just wanted to really quickly finish up with this long-term stuff, which to me is really interesting. So we show people visualizations. So we show people like days of the week, and then we ask them, you know, did you know that you had this cycle throughout the days of the week. We can show them like moving window through their emotions, right? So this person's kind of getting happier throughout the study. She got a new job here, right? So we say to people, you know, well, what can you tell from that kind of visualization? So she told that, you know, people are interested in maxima and minima in these situations, right? So what led to that increase? They want to think about these types of events. And obviously, having these types of records gives them insight into things that were happening in their lives. This one is not the greatest visualization. I'm not a visualization person, as you probably knew, right? But this shows the redemption narrative. So what we do here is we take all the negative events and we show their gradient, right? And so what a, uh, you know, I guess a positive gradient shows is that you started sad about something and you got happier. And what you'll see is there's only one exception in this person's data where something started happier and got sadder, right? So you can show them that kind of thing and, and they, you know, you explain it to them and then they start drawing these inferences about their own resilience, right? Which is bad things happen, I tend to feel happier about them subsequently. Okay, so just want to finish, you know, so what people say about the system at the exit interviews, it gives you a window onto what you're feeling, it gives insight in order to change. Both from a positive perspective, if something makes me happy, I'll do it again. Negative, Echo gave me a snap, uh, snapshot of meltdown moments. I could look at those and see that those things weren't normal. It forced me to confront my reactions and myself. I learned from it. 
when I saw one of those memories, I saw that I needed therapy. And this is true. This person actually went and sought professional help as a result of using our system. Recording it, putting it down, thinking that that's not the way I want to be. Okay, so I'm just going to skip through. We've got a lot more. I just want to finish up, just to leave a bit of time. So, life logging doesn't totally fix fallible memory. That's what I tried to show you at the outset. There are arguments that we can learn from these ideas that memory is adaptive, get some interesting designs looking at contexts where people want to forget. And then what I want to argue is that I think there's some real opportunities with well-being and mental health to be using these kind of really lightweight logging type applications um, to kind of understand ourselves and our past a little better. And I think it's good in this context, you know, as, a, as an antidote to NSA where everybody's afraid of you know, like masses of data to say, you know, there are contexts in which where we have an own and appropriate this data, we can use it to help ourselves. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so, so those are, I just want to thank those people who have collaborated on various of these projects. And then, as I say, the Echo stuff now, you can download it free. And if you like it or you hate it, let us know.